ChatGPT is a large language model developed by OpenAI that is used for natural language processing, tasks such as text generation and language translation. It is based on the GPT 3.5 model, which is a type of transformer model that uses self-attention mechanisms to process and generate text. It is one of the largest and most advanced language models currently available. The GPT-3 architecture is a type of a neural network that is composed of multiple layers of interconnected nodes. Each node in the network is designed to process a specific aspect of an input text, uh, such as overall meaning or the syntactic structure or the contextual information. And as the input text is passed on through the network, the nodes work together to generate a coherent and grammatically correct response. Neural networks are basically a subset of machine learning and are the heart of deep learning algorithms. Their name and structure is inspired by the human brain, mimicking the way biological neurons signal to one another. At a very high level, neural networks are comprised of node layers containing an input layer, one or more hidden layers, and an output layer. Each node or an artificial neuron connects to another uh, node and has associated weight and threshold. If the output of the individual node is above the specified threshold value, then the node is activated, sending data over to the next layer of the network. Otherwise, no data is passed along to the next layer of the network. Well, that's all I'll talk about neural networks in this video, but if you wanna learn more about neural networks or AI in general, visit Brilliant, who have also kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is a problem-solving website that provides interactive courses to teach you new ideas or to help you sharpen and refresh your existing knowledge on topics mainly related to math and science. The best way to learn anything is by doing yourself, and Brilliant is an amazing tool for learning math, science, and computer science topics interactively. Interactive learning helps you learn things six times more effectively than just watching lectures. Learning on Brilliant is so engaging, it almost feels like playing a game. And in case you get stuck, you aren't penalized for it. Instead, they give you in-depth explanations that help you make meaningful progress. Even though I have a ton of experience in software engineering, I routinely use Brilliant to refresh my knowledge on specific math topics like probability and statistics, various search algorithms, as well as machine learning areas like neural networks. I find that I not only enjoy the interactive lessons that Brilliant has, I also retain a lot more information more effectively. So if you're into improving your problem solving skills and learning new STEM concepts, visit the link in the description below to get started for free with Brilliant's interactive lessons. The first 200 of my subscribers to click the link below will receive 20% off their annual membership. Okay, so back to ChatGPT. So the main reason ChatGPT is the talk of the town right now is because of one of the key features of its architectures that allows it or gives it the ability to learn from large amounts of data. The ChatGPT model has been trained on massive amounts of text data, 175 billion parameters and 570 gigabytes of text data to be exact, which includes a wide range of topics and styles. For comparison, ChatGPT2 was over 100 times smaller at only 1.5 billion parameters. So as a result, the model is able to generate responses that are highly relevant to the prompts and that exhibit a level of knowledge and understanding that is similar to that of a human. And another advantage uh, of ChatGPT3 is uh, the ability to handle long range dependencies in the input text. This is important because many natural language tasks such as uh, language translation or text summarization require the model to understand the overall meaning and context of the text in order to generate the correct response. Uh, the self-attention mechanisms in GPT-3 architecture allow the model to capture these long range dependencies and to generate accurate and fluent responses. All right, that's basically it for ChatGPT. So that's what it is at a high level. So let's address the elephant in the room. Will something like this or AI in general replace software engineers? Well, talking about ChatGPT in particular, uh, large language models aren't really designed to write code. Um, they're best at uh, generating predictive text, uh, sentiment analysis, trimming or editing uh, textual data. Um, so any reasonable code that it's producing is merely t treating it as text. If anything, something like GitHub Copilot is probably far better at uh, generating actual code because rather than text or sentiment analysis, it's been trained on uh, a large data set of actual code bases so it can actually pull its 
uh, predictions from code itself rather than large voluminous text that something like GPT-3 has been trained on like from Reddit or something like that, right? But in general, the question whether AI will actually replace um, software engineers, the answer to that, at least in my perspective, is there is no chance. Unless you're all you're doing is copy pasting code from the internet, then you probably have bigger problems. But as of now, um, no, software engineers aren't getting replaced by artificial intelligence. See, the thing is that Artificial intelligence in a very simplistic way and at a very high level is very deterministic. There's always some heuristic to follow that it learns from various data or models. Uh, as much as naturalness there is in the outcome or how fluent it may seem, there's still a heuristic being followed, right? Um, so in terms of whether software engineers will actually be replaced by something like this, um, I wanna share a conversation I had with my friend, um, who actually runs a dog training institution in Chicago. So I was having a conversation with him and he asked me the same question, will something like chat GPT, is it a threat to software engineers, right? So to explain this concept to him, I followed back with a question to him and I said, hey, say someone randomly calls you and they say, I have a German Shepherd and He's acting weird around dogs, but generally inside the house, he's really well disciplined. But with other dogs, he acts really weird. Sometimes he gets into fights. Um, so then I told him if he can give me a set of instructions that I can follow to fix this. And his response was that there is no chance he can do that because while that symptom may be something that you've heard of other dogs having before too, so much of it depends on the specific dog, how it was raised, uh, what are its environments, what are the other dogs doing, how do the dog owners handle him, um, and, and so many other environmental and behavioral aspects that it's impossible for a dog trainer to simply produce a set of instructions on how to fix that behavior, even though he's worked with hundreds and hundreds of dogs, right? Um, so same idea I am kind of applies to software engineering is if someone asks you, hey, I want to build something like Facebook, uh, what should I do? Well, it depends, right? Like what's your goal? How many users are you going to have? What is your technology stack? How many software engineers do you have? What's your budget? Do you want it distributed? Do you want it not distributed? What's your disaster recovery scenario? So answers to all these questions really vary by each project and that can hugely affect what decisions you make. Even though there may be guidelines on how to build good software, how to build good architectures, what a group of engineers or a group of teams in an org end up building is actually very ad hoc. It, you draw on your previous experiences as an individual, as a team, but what software actually gets uh, written or how a service is designed really depends a lot in that specific scenario and what the requirements are. The bigger challenge is how do you provide this data as a training set, right? Because a lot of software design happens in meetings where a lot of people are brainstorming over multiple sessions, things get sideways. Then some people may do a lot of this in their head while they're thinking, like how do you translate thought process to something that is easily fed to a learning model, right? So unless something like that happens and we are probably at like GPT-10 or something like that, I don't see software engineers actually getting replaced by artificial intelligence. But what, what I do think it will happen is machine learning and AI in general will greatly influence software engineering. And most of this is probably going to be like an aid. Think of it as your sidekick, right? I already actively use GitHub Copilot and it's pretty effective at uh, giving me little snippets that otherwise would have wasted my time, right? I mean, of course, this is a very basic example, but you can see how as modern software engineers, you're dealing with a lot of different frameworks and programming languages and say you've been working with TypeScript for three years and suddenly you have to pick up a project that's in Go or Rust or Python or whatever, you may be rusty. So even simple things like helping you format the syntax or dealing with uh, string formatting and things like that can help you get Get up and going with that language that you might have forgotten, you know. So that something like that can save a lot of time. A far-fetched example could be if you can get some machine learning model to train on your code base. Maybe there could be a situation where there's a bug and the dev triages the bug to be, say, something like, hey, this is a 
time zone error where we've used the wrong time zone we need to make it like a universal time and they submit those parameters to an AI bug bot or whatever and then they go ahead and because they have enough context of the code base they can figure out all the wrong time zones and then update that with universal time or something like that and then send in a pull request that would save a lot of time for a particular dev having to do that and usually um, computers tend to be better at finding every dependency and everything like that so then they'll probably be more thorough about it way quicker but then once the PR is there, someone would still need to go, a real person would validate that, right? So I can see something like that happening, but even that is a far-fetched idea. How it may influence roles, um, that could be if, especially if like the simple bug fixing and things like that do come into fruition, then maybe entry-level positions like uh, internships and uh, software engineer level one, where you aren't really expected to do much other than learn and improve and get to the next level. Maybe those roles would kind of morph into something like a software engineer two role, right? So where as a human software engineer, your expectations start from level two because all the level one or intern level work is done by AI. Well, is it replacing jobs? Probably, but I wouldn't think of it that way. I would think of it as jobs morphing into something else, right? Remember the early 2000s or even late 90s when most software developers were probably like graphic designers or web designers. People were mostly writing static HTML, CSS pages. They were making a good career. They were making uh, a good living out of it and then things have changed now and if you're doing static HTML CSS stuff right now you probably don't have a job you know um, because the role has morphed into front-end engineering even that is really complicated right now you need to understand APIs you need to understand mobile loads battery concerns a lot of different frameworks and you actually have to understand algorithms and code even to be a front-end engineer you know there's no such thing as static and was this a result of artificial intelligence no I mean just the technology progressed and so yeah there there will be uh, changes. Uh, it will affect how we do things. It will act as an aid, maybe even morph um, software engineering in some ways, but it's not going to replace uh, engineering. So there is, there shouldn't be any fear in that area. But th that's just my thought. Give me your thoughts in the comment below. Um, and maybe I'll be wrong in three years when <laughs> none of us have a job, but I'm pretty confident we won't get there. All right. I'll see you in the next one. This is getting too long. Cheers. Bye.